Arno Gordal is um, in charge of a lot of people at Adobe. He basically manages and sets a lot of the vision for the team. He's responsible for the web tools. Um, so, so many of the products that we see and use come through his team and he's been responsible for creating some of the vision for. He's uh, also someone that works on web standards um, for open source products and he has a distinguished career at Apple where he spent 10 years um, working on us user interfaces and is largely responsible for the user interface for OS X 10. So this is a wonderful visionary in our field and so please uh, warmly welcome Arno Godal. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, being here this morning. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be here and uh, to uh, share with you some of uh, uh, really cool demos that we've been uh, working on that I hope you will find as inspiring as I do. Um, today is not my day. We, uh, so it's a very graphically intensive set of demos that I have for you. And actually being able to display them on screen would somewhat be important. So let's see if we can do a little reset there. So we were joking just before beginning uh, with uh, my team here and we were wondering, you know, what could possibly go wrong? So we're about you know, 30 seconds in, and uh, that's number one. So let's see how we do for the, for the rest of the, of the presentation. Um, so um, my name is Arno Gordal. Um, my team at Adobe does some amazing work, uh, both in terms of uh, contributions to open source projects, web standards, and building some really amazing tools. And what I want to do today really is highlight some of the, the work that they've been doing. So the web. Um, the web is a fairly new medium, and um, it's really coming of age. You know, there's really a lot of progress that's being made in the maturation of the web as a, as a medium, as a form of expression. Um, and the thing that's interesting, anytime that there's a new medium that gets introduced, the first thing that happens is that this new medium tends to imitate whatever medium came before it. When photography was invented, for example, at first, it was really reproducing what you could do with painting before really becoming a medium of its own. Uh, same thing when film was introduced. First films were essentially uh, stage plays uh, that were you know, transposed on another medium. Uh, but today, of course, uh, cinematography has come into its own thing with its own language, its own conventions, uh, and definitely lots of things that you couldn't do before uh, on, a, on the stage. Same thing with television and, and so on. And today we're seeing that with the web as well, where a lot of the content, especially at the very beginning when you, when you think about it, a lot of the content that was created for the web was a reproduction of what you could do with newspapers, magazines, articles, documents, Word documents, those kind of things. Um, but as the web has matured and become more and more capable, and as we have explored also what could be done with this medium that was different, we're starting to see new kind of experiences, web native experiences. And I think that that's really exciting. And I think that's the direction that, uh, that we need to go. So I want to show you some examples of that today, of what those web native experiences uh, can look like. So to figure out you know, what is a web native experience, um, I think it's good to think, well, what's special about the web? What makes the web different from other medium? And I think that there's three key characteristics that make the web what it is. The first one is that the web is connected. In fact, it's in the name, name right? The web, it's connecting things. And that's what it was conceived as at first as a way of connecting all sort of different resources and content all over the place. The web is also connecting people. That's what we found out. Maybe it's something that wasn't envisioned at the very beginning, but certainly today we see that that's a lot of what the web is about. So that's characteristic number one. Number two, the web is interactive. It's not a fixed media where you just passively consume the experience. 
with the web, you have the opportunity of actually interacting with this content and having a much richer experience that way. So that's characteristic number two. And then the third one, which I think is really important, is the web is malleable. And what I mean by that is that as an author, you can conceive of a certain way that you think of your content, you know, build it a certain way, but the people that are actually going to be looking at this content are going to experience it differently than maybe what you had imagined. They're going to be looking at it maybe on their different device. Um, those devices have a lot of different characteristics, a lot of different uh, screen resolutions, uh, lots of different dimensions. And the users actually have a lot of control over how to experience that content. They can change the font size, they can change the window size. There's a lot of different things that can alter this content. So the best web native content is designed with those characteristics in mind. It doesn't try to reproduce what you could do before, but it really tries to embrace what is special about the web and bring that forward. As an example, this presentation that you're looking at right now um, is actually HTML markup with some really nice uh, CSS styling that allows us to have like those really nice uh, transition. This is a framework that was built with our very talented uh, CJ Gem that I'm gonna embarrass right now, which is sitting in the front row. Um, and that you can use to really have an experience that is rich, engaging, um, and really nice. Now, if it was just that, you could say, well, you know, that's something that you can do with a presentation package. You know, that's not that interesting. But because it is HTML and, and CSS, what that means as well is that I can actually uh, share this. So the presentation that you're watching right now is available at this URL. Um, you can go along and, and go to this net URL right now. You can uh, look at it on your device. You can follow along. Um, don't go ahead too much. There are surprises in there that I want to unveil at the appropriate moment. Um, you can share it with others later. Uh, so it's really taking advantage of the fact that, you know, this is one of the things that you can do with the, the web. Uh, one caveat before anybody uh, runs into it. The current version of the presentation, because it references some things that are not live yet, uh, some of the demos that are in there are not working yet. We'll update that later. So if you come back uh, tomorrow, we should have that uh, uh, updated. That, which is, by the way, another great thing about the web, right? I don't have to like, send you another version of the presentation. It will just be updated. So that's an example of the kind of content that you can do with the, the web that maybe is not you know, your traditional web page and, and website. There's another ca very popular category of content that the web is used for, which is to build web apps. So things that go beyond uh, you know, some content that maybe is a little bit interactive, but really uh, build content that is mostly interactive. Right? It's really more like an application than, than content. And that can be web apps that are displayed on the desktop in your browser, or web app that you experience on a mobile device. Now, we actually had uh, some experience with web apps. We've built uh, a couple. A couple of years ago, we started looking into this. Uh, we started a project called Brackets, which is the code editor for the web, uh, that we built using web technologies, using HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, we've built also uh, Edge Reflow, which is a layout application, also built with a CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. And when we started those projects, because we wanted to build you know, web apps, uh, we needed to have a set of UI components that was appropriate for, uh, for an app. You know, the, right, the buttons and the sliders and, and all of the uh, widgets that you expect to have in an application. And we looked around, um, and there's a bunch of libraries out there that, uh, that do some of that, but we couldn't really find something that we, that we liked. Um, we wanted something that looked really great, that had a great user experience, and we wanted something also, very importantly, that was like super fast. Because performance is a key component of the experience that your users are gonna have when they, when they use your application. So we wanted something that was like really optimized, that worked like really well, both on desktop and on mobile devices. And 
So we looked around, we couldn't find anything that we really liked. So we decided, you know, we should build something for ourselves that we'll use because we need it. But um, that's something that would actually be great to share with the rest of the community because we're not the only ones who have a, a need for this. And that's when we introduced uh, Topcoat, which is a CSS library, very, very thin layer of uh, CSS uh, that gives you beautiful, fast uh, web apps. You get a whole suite of uh, components. You have, like I said, the buttons, the different uh, type of, uh, lots of different type of buttons, and all sort of other widgets that you need for a web application. Um, and it's available on GitHub, so it's an open source project. Um, we, it's fairly popular. We have quite a few people that are both contributing and using it. Uh, now, the thing is that it's still a work in progress, right? We're still working on it. It's not finished. It's not a, quite a one version yet. Uh, there's a lot that's out there already. There's, there's a lot of things that you can use, um, but there's a, also a lot that still remains to be done. And part of why we want this to be uh, a community effort is because we want your engagement as well. We want you to participate um, maybe that because you want to contribute some elements that you know are really important to you and that you want to be part of Topcoat. Uh, maybe because you're trying to use Topcoat and you're running into some bugs, some problems or whatever. Just letting us know that um, and using, doing that through a GitHub is a great way of participating and helping this make better for everyone, really. So at this point, I'm going to try, <laughs> and we'll see how that goes, to give you a quick demo of an application using Topcoat. So I have an iPhone right here, and we're going to try to connect. <laughs> Today is not my day. OK. I have network. Yes, let's try it. Let's see. Yes. Thank you. Come on, that's an achievement right there. All right, so I'm going to launch this uh, sample application that we have that shows uh, top coat. And um, we said that they were going to be uh, cupcakes. So here are the cupcakes. Here are the cupcakes. Cupcakes. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yes, thank you. It can only go up from here. Um, so we have a, your pretty typical you know, web, app, uh, web app with uh, a scrolling list of uh, delicious cupcakes. Scrolling. <laughs> I'm going to have to mime this demo, I think. So it's scrolling. It will catch up eventually before the end of the presentation. You have a uh, search field. So if you want to look for sprinkles, you can type you know, sprinkles, and you get your Favorite uh, cupcakes, there you go. Um, you have, you can, if you find a cupcake that you like, you can uh, just tap on it. You see the buttons, you have like your Facebook and Twitter buttons. Those are all built with uh, top coat. The navigation as well, basically all the layout in the presentation is using top coat. The back button uh, is a top coat button. You can bring the drawer, the menu drawer. Oh boy, it's really, OK, the drawer. Can you guys see it here well? Yeah. How, how is it in the back? Good? I should have brought a magnifying glass and should have done it that way. But. Um, and then we have a bunch of sliders that I can type on to filter the different type of cupcakes that I want. Right. So here you go. OK, so fairly simple app. Thank you for your cooperation, AirPlay or not, turn that off. Now, because this is all uh, HTML, CSS, of course, that means you know, it works great um, on the iPhone. But then I can also <coughs> show you the same thing in a web browser. So I want to show you actually how uh, some of, uh, uh, so how top code, top code is used in there. So, 
you're saying basically the same thing that you just saw on the, on the iPhone. I'm going to bring the, the slide menu, the drawer, and then uh, they said I want to customize and modify some of those uh, sliders. Because that's one of the things that we wanted to uh, enable with Topcoat, not just to give a great suite of uh, widgets that are ready to use, and they definitely are, but you can also theme them and customize them uh, to your own, um, to whatever you want. So here, for example, let's say that I look at this, uh, at this slider right there, <clears throat> and I say, okay, you know, that looks pretty good, but to, for it to be a little bit more in the theme of my uh, Cape Cod, shop, let's say that I want to change the color for the border. So I'm going to pick a beautiful pink. There you go. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm going to make the border a little bit bigger. And now I have my customized uh, slider. So I can just take that CSS and put it in my customized version of uh, top coat. And now I have the, the slider that I wanted. <coughs> Sorry. OK. Do you guys like this? Thank you. All right, so that's Top Coat. It's available now, it's on GitHub. Uh, you can go to uh, topcoat.io to uh, go and, and find out more about it. We have some documentation, we have some more samples. We have the layout of all the, uh, the widgets as well that you can play with and, and test with. And uh, try that. Give it, a, give it a go. Let us know what you think. Um, and get involved, contribute if that's something that you're interested in. We're uh, really interested in having uh, people give us some feedback. Now, switching gear, um, I want to talk about uh, SVG a little bit. So when you think about it, uh, SVG is really the graphical language uh, of HTML. Of course, there's a lot of other graphical formats, but SVG is the one that really fits well with, uh, with HTML. Let me ask you this. How many of you have some experience using SVG already? Raise your hand if you do. All right. I like this kind of crowd. That's awesome. You guys are going to like it. So why is SVG uh, so great? Well, there's a couple of key characteristics about SVG that really make it uh, unique. Number one, because it's a vector format, it's resolution independent. And today, that's something that's more and more important as we get a proliferation of devices with a great resolutions, uh, retina displays, and so on. And being able to have graphics that work well on all those different uh, type of displays is actually really hard. And SVG, for certain type of graphics as well, at least, um, does a really good job of helping you with that. Really great thing about SVG as well is that it can be embedded inside the HTML. So you have fewer HTTP requests to do, which means that you have lower latency, which means that you have a better experience on, on your page. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. And then SVG is, has a DOM-based API, and it's scriptable. So that means that if you want, you can manipulate or even create on the fly SVG content and do some great things with it. Now, that's all wonderful, but it turns out that manipulating SVG with the basic um, scripting APIs that exist today, it's kind of a chore. You have a lot of code that you have to write to do even something like pretty simple, and to do things that are a little bit more complicated, it gets really complicated. So we've been using SVG for a, a while ourselves, and we've run into this, where you know, we wanted to do more interactive things with, uh, with SVG, more sophisticated uh, manipulation, and we found out that having to like write the same placeholder uh, boilerplate code again, again was really tiring. So we came up with a new library that I'm delighted to announce today, which is called snap.svg. And what snap.svg is, it's the JavaScript library for SVG for the modern web. So what does it mean? The code that I just uh, showed you which is on the top, becomes the simpler code that's on the bottom. Now, if you just look at the number of lines of code, you say, well, that's about the same number of lines of code, but it's much more compact and expressive. And I want to show you some of the things that you can do uh, using uh, Snap SVG. So we have here the Snap SVG uh, logo. 
And uh, as you see, when it first shows, it animates. So I'm going to show you how we did this. So if I bring up the inspector, so first you're going to see, you know, that's, it, that's the SVG right there. And you notice it's not a lot of SVG, right? It's some fairly simple uh, polygons that we have here that just represent the, the content. And then if I go and have a look at the, the JavaScript for this, that's the JavaScript that actually does the animation. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, the first thing we do is we set the initial position of the, uh, the various polygons. We s offset them a little bit uh, on stage. And then we have a simple animation loop where we basically bring them back and fit, fit them back in. And we use the, uh, the snap SVG animate function to do that. Um, and as you can see, I mean, it's basically a, a, a matter of you know, setting it up and it's gonna be running the animation loop uh, pretty much on its own. And you can specify uh, an easing function, for example, uh, to have like a nice uh, motion and, and so on. So really, really easy to, uh, to set up. And of course you can do some more complicated things um, with it as well. But this is like a pretty basic one that kind of shows you what's possible. So let's have a look at another example. So this is a, uh, a SVG coffee machine. That's the SVG coffee machine. Have you guys seen the SVG coffee machine before? Well, here it is. Uh, I can show you that it says VG actually because I can just, you know, zoom in and make things bigger. And you see that it just scales as you'd expect. But then there's some snap SVG as well that's used to make it interactive. So now I can, actually that's the part that's scalable. The one was before was a screenshot, so sorry about that. Um, when I select a type of coffee, you can see that it shows what it's actually made of. So if you were ever curious, espresso, right? Just coffee. If you have a latte, that's some coffee and some milk. And you see the animations that, uh, that happen on the coffee cup and on the knob as it's rotating. You see the little uh, easing function that makes it a little bit more uh, fun and, uh, and realistic. So you can imagine that you could use that to do uh, infographics, uh, you know, all sort of different type of uh, interactive things that could be uh, uh, fun and interesting. And again, that you, know, you could do using like pure JavaScript APIs manipulating the SVG, but it, be it becomes really uh, hard really quickly to do. With Snap SVG, it becomes much, much easier. All right, let me show you another example. So this one is interesting, uh, also SVG, so I can zoom in again to, uh, to show you that. And now what we have, we actually have an animation. So this is text. And th that's one of the great things that a lot of people don't think about with SVGs, of course it's great for graphics, but it also gives you much more control over what you can do with text than you can with uh, HTML and CSS. Um, you can, like you can here, put text on the path, do some animations on it, uh, do uh, uh, using clip mask, clip mask with text, all sort of different effects that otherwise you basically have to uh, create a bitmap uh, in you know, Photoshop or something like that and then uh, use it in your, um, in your content, but the, the beauty of this with SVG is that this is actually still text. So if I want, I can you know, select it, it's still searchable, um, accessible, and, and all of that. So lots of uh, great benefits there. Okay, um, this is another example. So um, that's an interesting one. This uh, is actually some content that was created in Illustrator. Illustrator is actually a great uh, app to, content, to create uh, SVG content. You can export from Illustrator directly to, uh, to SVG. And once you have the exported content, um, the SVG exported from Illustrator, you can go in there, add some tags so that you can access the various uh, elements that you want. And then with Snap SVG, you can add uh, interaction uh, like this. Um, you can see that the, are, the trees are waving also in the, in the breeze. You can uh, actually even roll the dice, which is pretty cool. And you get some you know, really great looking content. Again, that's all vector that you can have some interactivity and animation with like, uh, really easily. So that's um, Snap SVG. We have a website that's uh, live now 
uh, that you can go visit. It's at uh, snapsvg.io, where you can see some of the examples that I just showed you. You can also download uh, the current version of uh, Snap SVG, start using it, um, and give us uh, some uh, feedback. We have documentation out there and, uh, and all of that. Um, and I'm going to show you another example, actually, from one of our uh, partners, PBS, that uh, has, we gave them like a preview version of uh, Snap SVG, and they built this um, front page for pbskids.org um, that uses uh, Snap SVG. So the little animations that you see here, the little cars that are moving along, uh, those are actually animated using Snap SVG. I think if I show you this, you're going to see in there somewhere. There you go. See, it says that it's created. So you believe me, right? <laughs> OK. Um, so that's live as well. And I just lost my on pbskids.org. So if you want to uh, go a real world example and see how they're doing it and what they're doing with it, you can just go there and, uh, and have a look. So pbskid.org. Um, so Snap SVG, the JavaScript SVG library for the modern web. Go visit the website, snapsvg.io. And if you want to find out more as we are continuing to make uh, uh, progress on the, the library, uh, subscribe on the Twitter at uh, Snap SVG. All right, so um, we talked about graphics. Another thing that we're thinking about a lot as well is layout and how to use the web to really convey uh, storytelling in a way that's different from what we've been able to do until now. We've done some uh, work with the National Geographic, uh, who, of course, have some great content, and they are very passionate about telling great stories through words and images. Um, and they've been doing that for many, many years and uh, with di many different medium as uh, new technology has, uh, has become available. And just like us, they're very interested in exploring, well, how can we take advantage of the web and what's special about the web to really have some web native experience that allows us to continue to tell the stories that we want to tell. So a few uh, months ago, we uh, did some work with them um, to take some content about a, a great story on the Redwood Giants and um, really make it a great web experience. Um, that's available on the GitHub as well. So if you want to go uh, down there and, and either play with it or see what uh, we've done and how we've done it, uh, you can do that. Uh, if you uh, uh, are looking online, this is a live linked to the, to the presentation, to the content for this demo, and you can have a look at that. Um, but there's another demo, demo that we've been working on, because it took actually a lot of work to build this previous uh, demo. It was all you know, handcrafted. So we've been thinking, well, could we have like, a better way of having like, this great experience, but without having to do so much uh, of uh, handcrafting to, to do that? So we came up with this idea that you know, it would be nice to actually have some sort of like template um, that we could define ahead of time. That would be something like this, where you have you know, a scrolling type of thing, uh, where you would essentially have pages, but the pages would actually match whatever screen you have. Right? So that's taking advantage of the, and thinking about the fact that the web is malleable. So you don't necessarily know, you know what a page is, because that's going to depend on which device you're looking at. But still having sort of this concept of you know, a screen full of things that you look at at a time is kind of interesting. So what if you could have something like this, where you'd have maybe like a, the, the header, and then you would alternate between you know, a screen full of text, and then you could just go up, a screen full of picture, and then keep going that way. Um, and it turns out that it's actually something that's not entirely easy to do um, with just web technologies that were available you know, a few years ago. But there's lots of new functionality that's available now that actually makes something like this possible. And um, that's what we've built. So uh, I'm going to show you, well, let me, show, but let me start by showing you the, the template that we use. 
So this is basically the template version of what I just showed you on the, on the whiteboard. And you see that the, the image is about one uh, screen full, text, and so on. And if I resize, right, the image and the text, the block of text, are going to change size accordingly to always be about a screen full. It's like magic. And the way we do this is using something called viewport units. How many of you have heard of viewport units? Excellent. How many of you have done something interesting with viewport units? Cool. It's been actually really hard to find you know, some really interesting things to do with viewport units. But we found out that this is actually a really good uh, example. A viewport unit, basically, for those of you who don't know, um, with 100 viewport units, that represent like one screen full, right? So no matter what the size of the screen in pixels actually is, you'll always have 100 viewport units. So if you want to define some size that's relative to the screen size, that's a great way of actually doing that. Um, so that's what we're using here to specify that the height of the image and the block of text are, uh, you know, 100 uh, viewport units. And then the other challenge that we had is like, you know, we have this block of text and the actual height is going to be variable depending on the size of the screen, but we wanted the text to flow from one block to the next, skipping the images in between. And that's something that we can do now with CSS regions. So if you look at the text that I have here and I change the size, the text is going to flow down and jump and go on the other side of the image. So let me show you that all put together with um, a demo that we've been working on with National Geographic with some of their great content. Um, and this is a great story about uh, baby elephants in uh, Kenya. Um, they're orphan baby elephants. Um, and uh, you can see here, so we have the sort of like the header, a screen full of text, an image that takes, you know, and you, this is a great way to have something that's, you know, really impactful. You can really get like a, a full screen experience for your, for your image, and then you switch and go on to the, to the text and so on. And um, because I'm, I'm on browser on the desktop here, I can resize things. So if I want to have like, you know, something more narrow, for example, again, you know, the image is always going to be a screen high and then text and so on. So that work, works great here, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to try to show you on the same thing on an iPad. Again, if I can get it to magically connect. It doesn't want to connect. Connect. Sometimes it works. But not today. All right, so if you're in the back, you pick the wrong seats. <laughs> but here it is, basically. So you have the, the content here, and you see this about one page word. So it makes, you know, scrolling really nice. And again, you get the, the nice full screen experience for the, for the images. And you can, it works whether you're using landscape or, or portrait, you know, whatever you, you want. There you go. Okay, so that's uh, baby elephants. Do you guys like it? Yeah? All right. Okay. So, like I said, the way that we're able to build this is because of some features uh, that are fairly new, viewport units, uh, it's available in a bunch of browsers already. It's pretty uh, broadly supported. And the other is CSS Regions, which is uh, a little bit more on the bleeding edge. Uh, CSS Region actually is available now on both iOS 7 and Mavericks that Apple just introduced yesterday. Uh, so it's available in the, those versions of WebKit. It's also available in the Chrome Can Canary build right now, so it's not turned on by default, but uh, you can uh, turn it on to play with it and experiment it. And we expected that it will be uh, part of the uh, mainstream version of uh, Chrome uh, really soon so that you can start using it and, and build some really interesting experiences with it. If you're interested in uh, the plight of the baby elephants, uh, you can do something to actually help them out. Uh, you only have to tweet, protect the elephants. And for every tweet with that hashtag, Adobe will be donating $1 to the National Geographic Society 
to help uh, save those uh, poor baby elephants. Read the story, it's a really uh, heartbreaking story. Um, but you can do something about it by tweeting. I expect all of you to be tweeting right now. Okay, um, so we talked about storytelling and uh, how we can make it easier to build some content uh, using a template that can, where we can just have the content fill in the, the template. Uh, we've been playing with another thing as well that's uh, a little bit more uh, extreme in terms of, uh, of design and uh, uh, customization, and I'd like to uh, show you that now. So it's a great um, version of Alice in Wonderland reimagined. So let me show you this. And again, all those demos, you can play with it yourself uh, later. So with this one, what we wanted to do was to explore whether we could use text as an element in the story. So in this version of Alice in Wonderland, we have you know, great hand-drawn graphics that have a great experience. And you can navigate in the story simply by scrolling. So all I'm going to be doing here to navigate through the story is just going to be scrolling up and, uh, up and down. So um, you can read the, the beginning paragraph that sets the, the, the story for Alice before she jumps in into the, the rabbit hole. And then as you scroll down to see what's next, you see the text actually falling down the, the rabbit hole. All right, so let me do that again because it's so cool. Yeah. And as I keep going down, you see that we have some text that also is uh, being displayed in non-rectangular you know, rectangular boxes. You have text that follows the contour of the, of the different shapes that are in there. And then when Alice talks to the cat caterpillar, and then again, you know, I'm, I'm still scrolling down or, or up to go back. This is very simple navigation. And when the caterpillar talks, you can see that the, the words from the caterpillar that are kind of like smoke rings are filled inside uh, irregular shape. Again, you know, not rectangle, something that's a little bit more uh, interesting. And as the dialogue goes on, you see the text moves around and, and change. Um, I can show you the code. I don't know if it's going to tell you a whole lot. Um, I would have to go into and show you some of the JavaScript also to, uh, to do that. But you know what? I'm going to show you an example like in a second that actually makes that uh, even clearer. Because this one is a little bit uh, is, uh, sophisticated, let's say. So if I keep going, all right, Alice eventually encounters the, the cat. And again, you can see some text that's wrapping around the, the cat. So let me show you uh, how that's done with um, a little bit of a simplified example that, uh, that shows that. So I have that here. Um, nope. The cat, where is the cat? I've lost the cat. Oh, there you go. All right, so that's an example here. So you have the, the, the shape of the cat, and then you have the text. And you can see that the text is just wrapping around the, the shape of the cat. So as I resize, it just go, flows around. And how that's done is fairly uh, easily. Um, you have a, a CSS property called a shape outside where you can specify a polygon that is basically the shape that you want to use, and the text is just going to be flowing uh, around that. So pretty uh, straightforward, right? Now, the thing that you might notice is that um, you know, it's a polygon, so it has like all the coordinates of the, of, of the vertices of the, of the pot polygon. And you can imagine that entering all those coordinates by hand and figuring out what they are is kind of a pain to do. So um, we've built actually a little... Um, Chrome plugin that allows you to do some live editing of this. So if I select the property that I want to edit, which is the shape outside, you can see that on the, the page, now I have a representation of the outline. And I'm going to show you what happens when I actually try to modify some of those points. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to move it around a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. 
And now, I don't know if you see this, but the coordinates are updating live in the, the CSS. And you can also see change. So and you can do that, you can use it both for containing text that's wrapping around a shape or for text that's inside uh, a shape. Uh, you can also specify a uh, clipping region if you want. So if you have a, a clip path that you want to uh, edit, you can do that too. You can specify the, the values for the clip path. And again, you can have um, any kind of polygon that you want really and, and do some clipping there. Not very appropriate for this image, but very convenient to have uh, to figure out what all those coordinates are. Uh, it's a, what do we call it, the shape editor plugin. We'll have a, yeah, it's not a sexy name, but we'll have a link for it so that you can get access to it. Our branding team was not involved in that one. Maybe that's a good thing. There's nobody from branding here, right? Don't tell them. We love them. We love our burning team. OK, so that's some of the things that you can do with uh, uh, CSS shapes. All right. You guys are ready for cupcakes? Yeah. yeah. Cupcakes. So we've been working with uh, some great partners like National Geographic and here the, the Food Network to try to uh, imagine how we, what interesting things we can do with, uh, with their content. And uh, so we've been working on this demo with the Food Network, uh, which is kind of like a, a recipe book, if you will, but an interactive version of it. So often what happens when you have projects like this, the designers start oftentimes in Photoshop, and they come up with those great design for what the page should look like. They do things like that, right? And it looks great, and they use you know, everything that you can do in Photoshop to, uh, when you're designing something. So here, for example, if I zoom in on the, uh, the button that they have, I don't know if you can see that in the back, but there's a very subtle texture to those buttons. They look a little bit uh, distressed. I can uh, turn it off. So this is like just a plain blue. And then if I turn on the, the texture, you see there's a little bit more dimension. It's a little bit more interesting. And they did that using a, a layer mask to do that in Photoshop because, you know, that's the, what you would do. And then they specified also the shape of the button, this kind of like star-shaped um, of the button as also a clipping mask in, uh, in Photoshop. So that's all well and good. And typically what you would do is you would take this graphic and slice it and create you know, five different versions of the buttons because they all have like different colors, they have different hover state and so on, and you know, have you know, that many assets. But the thing that we can do now, you can actually reproduce this content just using uh, CSS. So I'm gonna look at the finished version of, uh, of the site, and if I go look at this button, you can see that it looks exactly like it did in Photoshop. And the way we've implemented it is using a clip path to specify the, the shape, the star shape. Uh, and again, you could be using the tool that I just showed you to actually define all, the, all those points or export it uh, from uh, SVG or you know, whatever you, you want. And then the, the texture is actually also specified using a, a mask. There's a WebKit. Um, property right now that allows you to specify a mask on, a, on, a, on an element, and then you get this, uh, this kind of like a nice effect. It's very similar to what you can do in Photoshop. So that's great. So those are some things that you can do uh, today with, uh, with CSS. But another thing that designers very, very often use that uh, until now has been missing, and it's a real pain, um, is uh, blend modes. How many of you guys know about blend modes? OK. Um, so blend modes, um, if I look at the, uh, at the frosting here on my cupcake, so you see I have like a, a color and um, there's a blend mode that's specified here of multiply. The blend mode basically is going to indicate how one layer interacts with another and how the colors and the pixels are, are mixed. So if I do a normal, you can see that it, uh, you get a, get a different effect. If I do difference, for example, that's a very different one. So let, here the pixels are subtracted from one another, so you get you know, weird effects. But oftentimes, uh, having a blend mode allows you to really do the kind of 
effect that you want. In this case, the, the frosting is actually white. By using the multiply on top of the frosting with uh, a color, you can actually vary the color of the frosting. And we now have support for blend modes in Canvas, and they're also going to be coming soon to uh, CSS. So you'll be able to use exactly the same kind of effects that you have in Photoshop. Now we're going to be able to bring that uh, to uh, your web content. So if you have a look here and pay attention, you will see it's kind of a subtle effect, but it's there, it's important. The frosting actually cycled to a bunch of different colors. Can you guys see that? Is that awesome? So that's using blend mode in the canvas uh, to do that. All right, now let me, um, I'm gonna see if I can tempt my luck again. I have a version of this that's on the iPad. Oh, it is working now maybe. Let's try it. Just want to show you that uh, it looks very similar. And that's one of the beauty about this web content is that you can have it um, on your desktop, you can have it on your mobile device, you can package it as an application as well so that you can have something that, uh, that works uh, offline. And let's see if we, there you go. So same content again here, you can interact with it. I can pick my uh, favorite recipe. I can go to my, uh, let's go with chocolate buttercream frosting get the recipe, and I basically have my interactive version of my uh, recipe book here. I can select uh, how many uh, cups I, I need to make, and then go into step-by-step -step to read the directions, which is pretty cool. So that's nice, that works great um, on, the, uh, on the iPad. But let's go back on the desktop, and let's have a look at some of the things that we can do um, on the desktop that are kind of interesting. Oh, one thing that I forgot to mention, you'll notice as I go from one page to the other, do you see that, like, that cool effect with like the circles? You guys see that? I'll show it to you again. In slow motion now. Okay. Right, so that's a really neat trick. That's actually using um, a canvas as a, as a clip mask and uh, used to go from like one transition to another. Uh, something that's like, you know, pretty simple. That's something that uh, is supported on the, in WebKit at least. Um, and uh, that we hope to see available in uh, more browsers as well. It adds a little bit something, you know, that you get a little bit more of a interesting interaction uh, using that. So let's go and um, do cupcakes. You guys ready for cupcakes? All right, I was told that I have to put on the hat for the cupcake. <laughs> Cupcakes, getting ready. I have my eggs, flour. So I'm gonna start reading the recipe. So we're gonna try something. I am not sure at all that it's gonna work, but I feel bold today, okay. Ooh. Maximize. Yes. <laughs> so this is using the speech API to actually do voice recognition. The voice recognition is actually done on the server. Uh, it's, a, it's a Google API that allows you to um, recognize pretty much any text you want, and you can use that. You could use it to do dictation, but also it's kind of interesting to do hands-free uh, commands, right? So, uh, which can come in handy when you're, you know, in the middle of you doing your recipe and doing your uh, cooking. So, another interesting way of uh, actually doing that, an interesting way of interacting with your uh, content, uh, especially when you have, like, your hands dirty and you're full of, you know, uh, flour and eggs and so on, wouldn't it be nice if I can just wave at my screen to have it uh, switch pages. So I have a little device here that's a leap controller that allows me to do that. And the way it works is I can just wave at it and the pages turn. Do you guys see that?
This is so cool. I can't stop doing it. I'm going to do it again. Watch me. It works. It's awesome. This is great technology. Um, but the really cool thing about this is that I'm doing this from within some web content. Right? So you could think, you know, well, that's the kind of thing that really needs you know, native APIs and whatnot to really do this kind of uh, hardware integration. But uh, the Leap guys actually built it uh, in such a way that you can just use it from JavaScript in your, your web, web pages. So really, really cool. So by the way, we do have cupcakes for real. Uh, I have uh, some uh, right there. So we have some nice Adobe cupcakes. We have the Snap SVG cupcakes. And you can find them at the uh, Adobe booth. So drop by the booth, and we'll give you real cupcakes. OK. So a lot of the things that you've seen in, the, in this demo um, around cupcakes, clip paths, blend modes, uh, allow to do this really more refined kind of you know, graphics that uh, um, really push the experience in, in the richness of what you can do using a web technology. This is a leap motion controller. The, the leap motion guys are here at the conference. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, drop by their booth. And this is a device that exists. It's shipping. So uh, you can uh, get one for yourself and uh, start thinking about you know, how you can make use of it. And you can follow them on Twitter as well uh, to find out more about uh, what they're doing. Now, we do a lot of work around uh, open source. And the reason for that is because the web was built on an open foundation. And um, that's something that's really important to us. We um, are participating in a number of open source projects that are web related. Uh, we're contributing to uh, WebKit, to Blink, to uh, Gecko, the, the, the browsers. Uh, we work on fixing bugs. We work on implementing features like CSS regions, CSS shapes, and uh, blend modes, and, and many others. We contribute also to other projects like jQuery, the Web Platform Docs project. Uh, if you don't know about Web Platform Docs, please check it out. Um, CreateJS is another one that we're uh, very closely involved with. And we do all of those contributions because by participating in the community, that allows all of us to get a better tool with which to express ourselves, which is really what the, the web is about. So we try to do that. We try to contribute as much as we can to those different projects. And then from time to time, you know, and I encourage you to do the same thing, by the way. All of those projects welcome contributors from anywhere. You don't have to be uh, anybody special to really be able to participate and contribute. Um, very easy to do. You'll be welcome with open arms. Um, but maybe also you have an idea for something that just doesn't fit in one of those projects. And if that's the case, start your own. Um, and that's what we've done. There's a number of things that we've also started, like uh, Apache Cordova, Brackets, Topcoat, and now Snap.svg, where we decided to start those projects after looking around and seeing that there wasn't really anything that matched what we wanted that we could contribute to. So we started them, but with the idea that others would come in and also contribute that are interested in the, those same things. So I invite you to do that uh, for all of those projects. Please participate, give us your feedback, let us know what you like or don't like about them. Um, and make them your own, really. That's really what this is about. If you want to find out more about some of the projects that we have, you can visit the URL that's right here. Um, Intel uh, yesterday had a great session where they talked about some of the, the things that they're doing, actually, with some of the, the projects that we have. In their new uh, Intel XDK, they are actually using brackets, uh, Cordova, and Topcoat. Uh, to offer a great solution for HTML5 developers. And this is a great example of the benefits that everybody gets by having those uh, projects be open source. As a community, we all get better tools as a result, which is uh, fantastic. So thank you, Intel, for uh, considering our, our projects and incorporating them into your solutions. We have all the demos that you've seen today. They're going to be available on uh, GitHub. They are not all there yet. It's going to take us a few days to uh, uh, finish some of them and upload them. Uh, but there's already a lot that's there. So you can uh, follow this, uh, this URL to, uh, to find out more. 
And if you check again in a couple of days, you'll see uh, a few more that will have uploaded. But pretty much everything that I've shown today, you'll be able to uh, have a look at, and you'll get access to both the demos and the source as well, so you can see how everything is done and tweak it, modify it, uh, whatever. So the goal of my team, the, our mission, is to make the web better and to build great tools. Um, that's something that you know, we're very passionate about and that we're taking very seriously. Um, we're very happy to participate and be involved in the community, make some contributions that help you know, push the web a little bit further. And we're also very passionate about building fantastic tools that allow you to really harness all the power of the web platform. Uh, we have uh, a series of tools that we're calling the Edge Tools and Services that uh, try to help you uh, create great content. And you can find out more about those tools on html.adobe.com. Finally, um, what I'd like to ask you to do, and I hope that I've been able to show you today with some of those demos, that the web is really a fantastic platform that is becoming its own thing, that it's unlike any other medium that has come before. And I think that we all have a responsibility to think about how to create content that is really web native, that really takes advantage of the web as its own thing. So I want to encourage all of you to think web native. And if you find some examples, or maybe if you create some examples yourself that where you think that really embodies this, uh, I encourage you to tweet about it. Uh, I suggest that you use the, this uh, hashtag. And uh, because I'm really curious to uh, see what you think and uh, other examples that you find that, uh, that really do this. And I think this is something that we can all benefit from and, and learn from. So think web native and tweet about it. Again, if you want to find out some more of what we're doing around HTML at Adobe, html.adobe.com, easy to remember. And if you want to uh, find out more about uh, what uh, I'm doing, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at uh, Arnaud. Arnaud. That's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for uh, coming, and have a great uh, conference. <laughs>